Welcome to the first episode of Anime Asylum. I am your host, Christina Talley, and today we're going to be talking about one of my first introductions into the world of anime. Released in 1988 and directed by Kishiro Otomo, Akira has been regarded as one of the most important and highly regarded anime releases of all time. The audiences who first saw Godzilla released in 1954 might have been watching a documentary. After all, the damage by the scaly Big G was no worse than metered out by B-29 bombers during the Second World War. Three decades on, the apocalypse was still a threat, but also a thrill. A way for a new generation to trample down the old world and build another. In Akira, one of the main characters, a colonel, mourns that. The passion to build is cooled, and the joy of reconstruction forgotten. Now, now it's just a garbage heap made up of a bunch of hedonistic fools. When Akira's director, Kish Kishiro Otomo, was asked which book had the greatest impact on him, he noticed H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, in which Martians obliterate 19th century London and the home counties. In her first sights of Akira's Neo-Tokyo, it is a visceral red shape, suggesting a heart, lungs, or guts. Teen biker gangs rule the streets on huge phallic motorbikes that often blur into neon-colored speed lines. Armed police battle the rioting unemployed terrorist gangs, adding to the mayhem. In a super deluxe nursery housing a top-secret state po project, three withered children await the return of their divine brother, a boy named Akira. The main characters, the bikers, bomb cars, smash windows, and beat each other into pulpy messes. But they're part of one organism. We see them from a God's eye viewpoint passing under mammoth skyscrapers reduced to white dots like blood cells or zooming into aerial battles through Neo Tokyo's flooded bowels. At the climax, a boy swells into a fantastic bloated giant that mules, pukes, and excretes its way into oblivion. The film's high energy transformations are driven by cosmic forces, hoakly explained but brilliantly visualized. So where did all this begin? Otomo started his career as an artist creator of manga comics, the format in which Akira was born. But he'd always been a film geek, a country boy. Okomo traveled three hours by train to see the latest films when he was still in high school. He was at the right age to see Easy Rider and Bonnie and Clyde, along with Sorter's Yaku Yakuza pictures and Japan's Pil, which are soft porn films. His first strips, published in the 1970s after he moved to Tokyo, were mostly short stories, but they grew in scale. His 1980 serial, Domu, about a paranormal battle between a girl and an old man in an apartment block, was hailed as a resurface in Kinji Fa Fukushuku's Battle Royale, an ultimate Japanese youth alienation fantasy where evil adults were trying to kill their kids off completely. Akira also anticipates certain Hollywood comic book films in its overstuffed plot. The film compresses hundreds of manga pages, originally published over several years, into two dazzling but very confused hours of animation. Subplots and support characters are truncated or plain forgotten. Plot points are vague, even contradictory. Perhaps it was just the difficulty of compressing such a long strip, which hadn't even been finished when the film was made. It also seems possible, though, that Otomo wanted to throw an extra twist to surprise fans of the manga. For example, the Akira that Tetsuo unearths in the film is very different from the one he finds in the strip. And yet, this messy plot is a big part of Akira's fascination. More than any sci-fi film since Blade Runner, it hurls a viewer in the middle of a world that bleeds from the screen in multiple hinted backstories. The action scenes are a blend of bloody carnage and information overload. The first 15 minutes serve up the end of the world, a new metropolis, riding students, biker thugs in high-speed chases, and paranormal beings fleeing from sinister men in black. The whole heady montage overlaid with TV news reports and dog food commercials. The spectacle takes on muscular momentum driven by the brilliant score that's full of explosive breathing and clacking percussion. Later in the film, an Apara Tetsuo fights his way through the tanks and helicopters, taking on a Supergirl on a huge metal globe as giant pipes and energy beams destroy the surrounding infrastructure. Then a military satellite comes into play and the battle goes into outer space. Akira demands to be seen on the big screen. Harry Knowles, founder of It Ain't Cool News, 
remembers college theaters got a hold of that film and just played it over and over. It became a midnight thing. When I went to college, Akira and Ghost in the Shell played forever. Akira became a true midnight movie, befitting an action film that often feels like an endless fever dream. In Britain, too, many viewers first caught Akira at one-off cinema showings around the country. One of the first to see it was Andy Frayne, former marketing manager at Island Records, who checked it out as a possible commercial pr proposition. It blew me away, he said. I've never seen anything like it. It was like an animated Blade Runner, clearly not for children, but a well-crafted philosophical movie that happened to be an in animation. America had enough of Japanese animation fan base for Akira to be released on video. In Britain, where anime was not as, as known, Frayne said about creating a new brand, I started thinking Akira was more than a great film. It might be a phenomenon. Were there more films like this in Japan? If so, could treat them like a record label, like Def Jam, and a genre itself. No one knew the names of the films, the names of the directors, anything about them other than the fact they were brand new. And if you enjoyed one, you'll most likely enjoy others. The result was a so-called manga cartoon brand that was unleashed in the 1990s. A few years later, Frame's new company, Manga Entertainment, will co-produce another science fiction Japanese animation, Ghost in the Shell, which would be one of the main inspirations for The Matrix. In the years after Akira, Manga Entertainment caught flack for its emphasis on sex and violence, which fans said misrepresented the medium, but anime was equally stereotyped as a violent animation in America at least until Pokemon and Spirited Away arrived a decade later. The apocalyptic vision of Akira seared its way into the global consciousness, even in parts of the world torn by war. In 1993, a Japanese critic was walking through a bombed-out Sarajevo when he was amazed to see a mural from Akira on a crumbling wall. In one panel, one of Otomo's scrowling teen bikers glared out of a world gone to hell, with the caption, So it begun. So that's all the time we have for this week. This is Anime Asylum. I am your host, Christina Talley, and I hope to catch you all in two weeks when the next episode drops. Until then, everyone be safe, everyone be good, and see you all then.